I was reading a story this week um, in preparation for this. Uh, This is a a testimony of a a woman a number of years ago. She says this, For several years I had struggled with severe heart failure, her physical heart. She says, No matter what medication I tried, I continued to get worse. During my lowest point, I wanted to give up. I wanted to, to die. I couldn't bear the suffering any longer. My family had to help me do everything around the house, and I was perpetually tired. I didn't have hope. I didn't have anything. I just couldn't bear the suffering anymore. I can't relate to this personally. I've never had this experience. But I I, I wonder if we put ourselves in the place of this, this lady. She's gotten this prognosis, this diagnosis of severe heart failure, something going on with her heart, something that the medication can't touch, what that would do and how you would feel kind of the hopelessness that you would look at life with, the emotions that you would struggle with. I want us to to think about that and sit in that just for a second, because this is a story of a woman who actually was given a heart transplant. And I think the contrast between what you would feel before the heart transplant and what you would feel after receiving a heart transplant is profound. She she goes on to say, when we found out that I was getting a heart, I was giddy. I knew right away that I wanted to meet my donor's family if they were willing. I wanted to know the people who gave me my life back, that if they hadn't made that difficult choice, I wouldn't be here today. I would be dead. So she says, in October 2008, about a year after the transplant, I wrote a letter to them. Right, Right away, it says the family called and said they were eager to meet me as well. My donor's mother and I were both crying on the phone. She said, we live in Corpus, Corpus Christi, and we want to come see you, but we, can't, we only can carry two people in our car. So they, they went to her instead. So she loaded up her husband and children, and they drove down to Corpus Christi in Texas. I'll never forget the emotions of that first encounter. When my donor's mother and I locked eyes, we both began to cry. I took her hand and put it on my chest, and we both laughed, and then we cried together. See, the before and after on that is just profound in the life of this woman. She had received a a gift that in human terms is probably the greatest gift that anyone could ever offer, the gift of a a literal life, a heart. We have one, and yet she had been given a second one because someone's family member had been injured or sick and had died, and they donated the organs. Now, I wonder, as I think about that, what what kind of changes would she have made to her life? If I were her, I would have probably given up caffeine. Uh, I would have have treasured that that heart and done every... I would have read books and I would have said, what what can I do to take care of this precious gift that has been given me? My my life would have changed. I I would probably like... Cut out red meat. Cut out all the things that they say aren't good for your heart. I would, I would be very diligent about exercise. I would, I would probably have a renewed uh, perspective on my life, my relationships, my priorities. There would have been a whole bunch of things that would change as a result of getting a gift like this. Now, the interesting thing is, I don't know the follow-up on this woman, This happened probably a decade ago, decade and a half ago. It could very well be that she's no longer with us today. The reality is that that heart that she was given at some point is going to stop beating and she will die. And yet it was this profound gift. But friends, we have been given, we've been just singing, Uh, Carly Carly alluded to it when she was talking, we have been given the most, a tremendous, astounding gift that isn't just going to keep beating for for a decade or two or three decades and then it's going to cease, as profound as that gift is. We've been given a gift that is, is to change everything about us, it offers us everything both in the present and in the future, in our letter to Colossians, the Apostle Paul, he, he says this in verse 127, and I think this is the center, this is the core. We've been talking about the gift that God has given us. And in chapter 1, verse 27, he says this, he says, this mystery, which is Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. This is a tremendous, amazing gift, better than any, any organ that you could be given. The, the fact that the God of the universe, the one who created everything, he lives inside of you. Colossians is well known for describing who Jesus is. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for from him and through him and, and to him are all things, right? It says in chapter 1. And then it says this, and that one, he resides in you. That is a tremendous, world-changing gift. And it's not just for today because then it says the hope of glory, the hope of glory. It's not just for today, but it is the promise of, of, of something in the future that one day everything's going to be restored. Your body's going to be resurrected. You're going to dwell in a land and in, in a place and in a kingdom that, that has, has truth and beauty and goodness. There will be no more pain, no more crying, no more suffering because the former way of things has, has passed. This is the nature of the gift that we have been given as followers of Jesus. And in the same way that a heart transplant necessarily needs to be transformative to the person who receives it, in that same way, the, the gift that we have been given needs to transform us. And so last week, Matt was with us. He did a great job just, just going through Colossians chapter 3 and talking about some, put, taking off the old and putting on the new. And the things that are, are to change and that, that are supposed to become more and more true of us as followers of Jesus. And this morning, we are going to actually finish up our study in Colossians. We're going to look at, at where does this transformation, where is it supposed to show up? Where is it supposed to be evident? So if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 18. I'm going to start reading actually in verse 16 to give us a running start because verse 16 and 17 are just, just so good. But Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 down to 4, chapter 1 is our text for the morning. This is on page uh, 984. If you have a, one of the Bibles that we give away, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible. We, it, it doesn't quite look like this, but it's a really nice ESV uh, Bible. If you don't have one, we'd love to give you one because we believe the Bible is the Word of God. I mean, the, the fact that we have this, that it's in our language, that it's been passed down to us is a miracle and just a wonder in and of itself. And if you don't have one, we'd love to give you one. Uh, Pastor Matt, he puts together every month a Bible reading plan. If you don't have a Bible reading plan, I'd encourage you to get that for January. You know, we're, there's four books, James, Joshua, Jude, and Obadiah on there this month. And just, it's about a chapter a day, which isn't, that's a few minutes a day. I'd encourage you to get that if you don't have one. But Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 16, and we're going to go down to 4 and verse 1. He says this, let the word of Christ, now Matt, Matt talked about this last week, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, in chapter 3, he starts talking about the, the internal changes that are supposed to be true of us as followers of Jesus. But then he transitions to some specific places that this transformation is supposed to be evident. Verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. And do not be harsh with them. Children, my favorite verse in the whole thing. <laughs> Children, just kidding, not really. Uh, but just wait, the next verse gets me. So, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, Here we go. As people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, 
Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This morning we're going to look, I, th- I think Paul gets into where, specific, a specific place where the, ch- the change that should be in us, that is in us, ought to be evident. It ought to be manifested. It ought to be lived out. He gets very specific here with us. And then we're going we're gonna to look at why is that? Why? And he comes back to this point several times throughout the text. Why is this to be the case? And then lastly, I want to think with you, what does this mean? How do, we, how do we maybe think about this, put it into practice, evaluate ourselves? So where, where is this supposed to become evident? What Paul is saying here essentially is you look at the, the argument of the book, all that he's been saying is that God's gift to us, what he has done for us in Christ. That's why we were looking at, at this book during Christmas, because we think about gifts. But Christmas is not, in Colossians, is not just about the gift of the baby in the manger. It's about everything that goes with it. God's great gift to us, it necessarily transforms our relationships. That's the, the place where it essentially must be worked out where it ought to be evident that there is something that is transformed and changed about, about us. It, it is in our, relations, our relationships. This, this whole thing, he gives six roles. He says wives and husbands. He says children and fathers. He says servants and masters. And each one of those roles at the time would have probably been within what we would know as a household. Anybody here ever seen Downton Abbey? few of you, n- none of the guys are going to admit. Uh, I'll tell you, a number of years ago, my wife, she's like, hey, I want you to watch this show with me. I was like, Downton Abbey, that's lame. <laughs> guys don't watch that. She said, oh, just watch one. So, you know, being the good, loving, kind husband, I, I said, okay, we'll watch, we'll watch one of the silly show. And she knew exactly what she was doing because that just set the hook in me. We binge watched all of them from, uh, from then on out. So anyways, I'm a Downton Abbey fan. But, but in Downton Abbey, you have, you have the family... And then you have the servants. But it's all one household. And so as Paul, he's, he's talking about this, this is, this is not, it's not directly analogous to any situation that most of us are f- familiar with. But he's talking about the closest relationships to a person that you are living with on a day-to-day basis. That's what he's talking about is he, he goes through these roles. And he says, those things, each one of them needs to be transformed. He starts, uh, he starts with wives. And if, if you want like a parallel passage where Paul kind of fleshes out a little bit more of this, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, he gives a more in-depth look at wives and husbands. And then he does talk about children, parents, slaves, and masters. He, he talks about all six of these in the same order in Ephesians chapter 5 and in, in chapter 6. But he says here, he says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So what is it supposed to look like for a a wife to live this out? He says, you're supposed to submit. And and I know, I've I've done a lot of premarital counseling, sat with a lot of couples, and we look at a chapter like this, we look at a chapter like Ephesians chapter 5, and we get to this word, the S word. And that like grates on modern sensibilities. When he says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Now, now I want to I say what that means is to come under. To come under the, the leadership, the headship of, of that, that man. That's what he's saying here. If you're not, a, you're not a wife, you're not a husband, you're like, well, why does this apply to me? Well, I'll, I'll say this to you. If you're not, you're not married, in God's economy, this is, this is the kind of person that you want to be looking for. If you're not married yet, Gentlemen, look for a lady who puts herself under the authority of God, because that's, that's what he is calling wives to do here. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Notice a few other things. He, this is something that wives voluntarily do. It does not say, husbands, make sure your wives submit. It doesn't say that. Interestingly, also, as he goes on to, he talks about children in verse 20, he says, children, obey your parents in everything. He goes on to bond servants in verse 22, he says, bond servants, obey every, in everything those who are your earthly masters. He doesn't say that to wives. He says, simply, wives, submit. It's a different word that's used. 
I think one of the reasons that submission has a bad rap today is because it has been a term and a concept that has been abused by men throughout, throughout time to, to get what they want. It's become, well, it, the Bible says you need to submit. So go get me my dinner and take care of all the things I want to do and, and act as my servant. That's not the picture of a healthy marriage that we get out of Scripture. And yet there is this, this like order to, to marriage. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. The posture of, of uh, a wife is to be in submission to her, her husband. But here's, here's the thing, and I, I say this to couples all the time. I've been married to Rebecca for 17 and a half years. She's awesome. I married way out of my league when I married Rebecca. She's not here at this service. I think she's coming to second service, so you can all tell her I said that, all right? <laughs> it's true. It's way true. <clears throat> But here's, here's how normal marriage ought to work. As you look at the Bible, and we're going to get to husbands in a minute, but as you look at the Scripture, we know from Genesis chapter 1 that both man and woman are created in the image of God. They're equal in dignity, equal in value. There's not a difference there. It's not that a husband is, is better, smarter, more valuable. That, that, that's not what we see in the Scripture. And so the normal, I believe the normal day-to-day -day relationship between a husband and a wife is one of conversation. You're just walking life together. And most of the time, you walk through life together, you're like, hey, what do you think of this? Hey, what do you think of that? And, and a lot of the times, you're just in agreement, right? Because you married someone, hopefully, that you get along with, that you agree with on things. And so you're in agreement. And there's no, there's no place there, if you're in agreement, this submission thing doesn't come up. Every once in a while, Rebecca and I, we will, we will have discussions about things. I, I think, hey, I think we should do this. And she's like, well, what about this? Or she thinks, we, we need to do this. And I think, well, what about this? And we have a discussion. But most of the time, our discussion ends up with us getting on the same page together and moving forward as a couple. That's not a submission thing. That's me listening to her, her listening to me, us working it out and figuring it out together. And oftentimes, uh, she has saved me from mistakes, right? Because I'm like, hey, let's go do this. And she's like, hold the phone a second. Have you thought about this thing over here? And I'm like, oh, yeah, let's not do what I just said. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, in 17 and a half years of marriage, and I, this isn't a number like, it's not a magical number, there has been in our marriage one time that I can think of we're in the normal course of marriage, we couldn't get on the same page about something. Through talking and conversation, we couldn't like, come to some sort of agreement. And in that moment, I'll tell you what happened. She said to me, she said, well, the Bible says wives are supposed to submit to their husbands, and so I guess we'll go with what you think. And you know what that did to me as a man? I was like, I really hope I'm right. <laughs> Because this is going to be bad. <laughs> if I, I, she, she wanted that over there, and I said this, and, and we went with this, and it, it blows up. This is not going to be pretty. Right? There was a responsibility that was placed on me as a husband because she, as a woman, obeying what the Scripture says, not what I said. She was putting herself ultimately under the authority of Scripture. She said, okay, it's, it's your call. You're the head of the house. Now, thankfully, in God's grace and mercy, it didn't blow up. It went very well, actually. I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but I think this submission thing is more of a posture of the heart than a day-to-day -day reality in good and healthy marriages. And, and it shouldn't be that a wife just gives up everything she wants because her husband says, well, look at what the Bible says. You have to submit. That's, that's not what the scripture is saying. How do I know that? Because if you look in the, the next, the next uh, very next line, he says this, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love your wives. In Ephesians chapter five, he goes on, he says, husbands, love your wives as or in the same way as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In other words, marriage is this mutual relationship between two equal people, and, and sometimes they're, they're, you, know, you can't get on the same page, but in general, 
What marriage is supposed to look like is this, this man not getting what he wants, but sacrificing himself for the good of his wife, for the desires of his wife, just as Jesus sacrificed himself for us. So husbands, what does it look like to be transformed? It's that you are supposed to love your wife. Paul says in Ephesians 5, as Christ loved the church, and do not be harsh with them. And, and here's the thing about being harsh. Like, I, I have to wrestle with that like, on a daily basis. I can get short, I can get uh, impatient, I can get frustrated, and this harshness can come out. So while the submission thing for, for a wife may come up on a rare occasions, this love thing and not being harsh thing comes up almost every day for me. He continues, my favorite verse, right? Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything. This is what it's, it's to look like. Kids, you're, you're supposed to listen to your parents. Are your parents always right? No. What if you think they're wrong? This is not Pastor Seth saying this. This is what God has inspired in his word, that the proper order. What we're starting to see here is there, there's an order within the, the household, that God has structured things in a certain way that they will work best in a certain way. You'll get good outcomes this way. Children, obey your parents in everything. Then he says, fathers, don't provoke your children. Don't make them mad. Don't beat them down. He says, lest they become discouraged. Again, this is, this is like a daily thing for me because I have high expectations for my kids. And I expect them to behave a certain way. And the question is, are my kids going to become embittered? because of the way that I interact with them? Am I going to beat their personalities down? Or are they going to flower and bloom as a result of me being their dad? For those of us who follow Jesus, it's supposed to be the second one. It's supposed to be the second one. He goes on, he says, verse 22, he says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. And now this, we don't have a direct analogy because we don't have bond servants today, slaves today. They, these, these were people who lived in the house. They were servants. They didn't get paid. The nearest analogy we would have is like an employee kind of relationship, someone who works for someone else. In, in fact, he's, he goes on in verse 23. He says, whatever you do, this is where it can apply to work, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. What does it look like to be transformed by this gift that God has given us? It it means even in our work, we're supposed to do it with an eye, not on serving a, a boss who may not be kind, just, or fair in our eyes, but it is on serving serving and working in such a way that we we think of it as not serving him, but as serving the Lord. See, as you look at these things, it's, it's kind of touching on every area of life, every hour of our day. He concludes with masters. Chapter 4, verse 1, masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly. See, what he's just done, and he hasn't, he hasn't exhausted the list. I'm sure there's other things we could look at on the list. But he's just said, you know, the, the place where this transformation, this gift ought to change you is in those relationships that are closest to you. In the places you spend hours every day of the week, where you put your most time, the way you are with other people ought to be transformed because of what God has given to you. So why is this? And I, I think this is interesting because he, he makes it very explicit. Because now, now that we've been given this gift, how can we not orient our lives? How can we not structure our lives? How can our lives not, not be centered on this new gift? Just as that woman, she got that new heart and it was beating in her chest. Without it, she would die. Her life, in many ways, was centered on that new reality. How can our lives not be centered, oriented around Jesus. If we really understand, that's why gathering and like reminding ourselves and singing and hearing God's word is so important because uh, oftentimes what happens is in, in my life, my life wants to go back to being oriented around me. But now our lives ought to be oriented around Jesus. Look, 
Look at what he says in verse 18. He says this four times. He ties these things back to Jesus. Verse 18, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. As is fitting in the Lord. Now, what does he mean by that? We can think of submission in our day as like, well, that just means you're weak. I think the moment, in my mind, one of the moments of greatest strength of the Lord was when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's so, so overcome that Luke says he's, he's sweating blood as he's praying. And he's praying to the Father and he says, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, let's do that. Let's not do what we're about to do here because it's going to be really tough. But then you know what he says? Maybe the strongest words anyone has ever said, but not my will, but your will be done. Why is it fitting for a wife to put herself in the posture of submission to her husband? That is, a, that is not a move of weakness. It's a move in line with Jesus. Consummate strength and trust in her heavenly Father. He says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And it's interesting because both for husbands and for fathers, like th this little tagline, as, as in the Lord, he, he leaves it out. But I think it's inferred from the context. It doesn't make sense to me that, that he just excludes husbands and fathers from this thing. I think if you look over at Ephesians chapter 5, why are husbands supposed to love their wives? You're supposed to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And it, it, it talks about that a marriage is supposed to be this picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. That's why marriage is so, so important. Because it's supposed to be this picture of, of Jesus, him submitting to God the Father, but him also offering himself up sacrificially for our good. He says, children, verse 20, obey your parents in everything. And look what he says, for this pleases the Lord. I challenge you, if you're a kid or a grown-up, how many times in the Scripture does, does the Scripture say, hey, do something and that pleases the Lord? He doesn't say it about wives here. He doesn't say specifically wives submitting their husbands pleases the Lord. He doesn't say husbands loving your wives specifically pleases the Lord. He doesn't say it about any of the other things. He only says it about this one, which is very fascinating I wonder if in the eyes of God, when he sees children obeying their parents out of reverence for him, if that doesn't just give him a little extra smile. And in that, there is a picture, once again, of the Lord Jesus submitting himself to his Father. And it's a picture of us, how we are to relate to God as well. We are his children. We're to obey him in everything. And then he says, fathers, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And I just, I just think this goes back to, to our relationship with God too. What if, what if we had a God and every mistake that we made, he came along and he pointed it out and he publicly shamed us and he, he, he just ran us down. What, what if that was the nature of our God? But it's not. He's good and he's kind and the Bible says he's long-suffering and he's patient and he sacrificed himself for us. That's the kind of heavenly father we are. And earthly fathers, we are to be a picture of that heavenly father because of what God has done for us in Christ. Verse 22, he says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Verse 23, he goes even further, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Man, that's a way to think about work. The way we often think about work is, man, my boss is terrible, and uh, I, yeah, whatever it is. He gives us a new paradigm for work. We can work heartily. No matter, no matter how our boss is, no matter how our job is, we can, we can see it as, as towards the Lord, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Then he says, you are serving the Lord Christ. 
It's a new way of thinking about work, oriented around Jesus. Last, lastly, he comes to these masters, these guys who are the boss, and he says, treat your servants fairly and justly. Why? Knowing that you also have a master in heaven. See, each one of these things, it's transformed by, by what God has done for us. And in each one of these relationships, we see kind of a, a little bit of the Lord Jesus Christ and his relationship to the Father and his relationship to, to us and, his, and his, his, his submission. We see pictures of that. And what Paul is saying, big picture here, is all of our relationships ought to be transformed. The people around us ought to see change in us because of what God has given us, the great gift that he has given us in Christ. That's where it's supposed to be worked out and evident. So what does this mean? You know, it's a new year, and it's a time for New Year's resolutions. And I, I, would just, I would just say this. Evaluate. He gives us six categories to evaluate. Evaluate, pray, and seek change. Evaluate, pray, and seek change. Evaluate. So if you're a wife, you look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20. How does that, how does that fit in your, your life, your thinking? You recoil against that. You have questions about it. You want to come here up here after the service and, and like uh, talk to Pastor Seth about it. That's fine. That's great. I'd love to dialogue about this, but, but the Scripture says what it says. Husbands, are we harsh? Are we laying down our lives for the good of our wives and our children? Children, what's your posture towards your parents? Is it that I, I will listen to them and, you know, think maybe they're not the dumbest people in the world? Maybe they know, know a couple things? And God has placed them in my life for this time so that they can help me get through and I'm to obey them? Fathers? I mean, I have an 11-year-old. My oldest is about seven years away, seven or eight years away from being out of the house. And I'm starting to think, man, and I, I think she will, but I ask myself this question, is she going to want to come back? Or is she going to think that coming back is just going to be, dad's going dad's to run me down, he's always got criticism, he's always, he's always, I'm never good enough. Employees, do you see your, do you see your work as working not just for your boss, not just for a paycheck, but ultimately working for the Lord? I mean, as Christians, we ought to be the, the best employees that we can possibly be. That doesn't mean we have to be workaholics. doesn't mean our job has to be our life. But with the time that we're there, we ought to be the best employees that we can possibly be. And bosses, are, are the people who serve or work under us ought to be better off because Christ is in us. So evaluate. If, if, any, of those, if any, any of those like resonate with you, here, here's the thing. You, you could say, Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. This is where the prayer comes in. Lord, I know I haven't been a, a, a kind son or a, a kind father. I haven't always been a loving husband. Sometimes I mail it in at work. And then you say, Lord, would you please forgive me? And then, then I, would, I would encourage you to pray a prayer like this because this is the kind of prayer I think God delights to, to answer. God, would you please just change my heart? See, on our own, we can't change our heart. The Word of God can change our heart. The Holy Spirit can change our heart. But, but I think God, He has the power to turn our hearts. Maybe in an instant, maybe ever so slowly towards what He wants them to be. But you could, you could pray, God, would you, would you make my heart more like yours? Would you let me be transformed in my relationships? And then I, I'd, I'd encourage you also to get others involved. I, I, had, I have this cool thing going on right now. There's a person in our church, and they asked me, in the new year they made a resolution. I don't even know what the resolution is. They said, hey, I want to text you. I want to text you every night. I'm just going to let you know how I'm doing. All right. And every night I get a text message. 
by God's grace, I did, I did good, to, good today. And that person, you know what they've done? They've, they've enlisted the help of the body of Christ in being transformed. And if you're not connected to people that you could text and, and ask, you, you could text me. I, I, can get a, I can handle a lot of text messages on my phone. But I, I'd encourage you, like, find some people. If God is placing something on your heart to be transformed, that you're, that's something that he wants to do, take that to some people that you trust. Ask them to pray for you. Ask them to hold you accountable. You can maybe find those people in a connections class or in a Bible study. We have a lot of stuff going on around here. But seek change. Seek change. We have been given the greatest gift, when you think about it, that, that we could possibly be given, Christ in us. The power of God living inside of us to, to help us live the kind of life that he wants us to live. And that's a promise that... that all the good that he's ever said, that we've ever longed for, that he's ever promised, it's going to one day be ours. Amen. Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's so much better than even a new heart. And my hope for myself, for us this year, is that we are just transformed. That we're fixated on it. We're transformed by it. So Lord, that's my prayer that you would help us to be transformed, that you would help us to be fixated on who you are, on what you've done for us in Jesus. Or that no matter the people you've put us around, whether it's the six categories, roles, places in life that, that Paul laid out here in Colossians, or whether it's other ones, or that you would be seen in us that our lives would be evidence, would be a witness to the people around us, that we are changed and transformed people. Lord, that you would make us quick to, uh, quick to apologize, quick to repent, quick to confess when we, we fall short. Or that you would give us soft hearts. Lord, that you would be glorified through us. I pray in your name. Amen.